Nitai Joseph, thank you very much indeed for coming on to Talk Beliefs all the way from New York. So how are you doing today and what's going on in the Big Apple? Uh, things are well. I'm working on my dissertation for a master's degree and doing some freelance writing and editing work, some exciting potential nonprofit work, and yeah, things are relatively well. Hey, Nitai, you are an ex Hare Krishna, and we're going to be talking today about your life in that group and what made you realize that it didn't have all the answers. And for anyone who doesn't know, can you just give us a brief overview of what the Hare Krishnas believe in and who the main figures are? Hare Krishna is not an official title, although they do use it themselves. It's kind of what naturally came to them in the 60s and 70s when they were very visible on the streets and in airports and stuff, chanting the Hare Krishna mantra very loudly. But organizations started in 1965 in New York City, the International Society of Krishna Consciousness. Um, this Bengali Hinduism, sort of Bengali Vaishnavism, uh, is sometimes what it's called, was brought here by one main guy, and he started the organization and built up a following around the world. And then... Um, there's been successors and it's grown and become a lot more institutionalized. Throughout that time, there's also been offshoots and I eventually joined one of these offshoots, though I was born into the larger organization. And overall, they share the same core beliefs, the same scriptures, they generally revere the same like, lineage of gurus. Um, the distinctions get more political and, and kind of nitty-gritty philosophical stuff. But the general beliefs are shared, which is a, a, a sort of theism uh, where Krishna is considered the ultimate original form of God. And uh, through the process of the religion, it's believed that you end the cycle of birth and death and reincarnation uh, and transcend to a spiritual plane in eternity where you basically live out a, a bucolic North Indian village life of God, which is how the spiritual world is, is depicted um, at its highest level, so to speak. And uh, prior to learning all of that and, and, and realizing that, that you're aspiring to turn into a village person in a spiritual plane, the, the preaching is more about how the material world is full of suffering and uh, desire leads to suffering inevitably. So even things that we think are pleasurable are actually just pain waiting to happen. And this is the, the first steps of the kind of redefinition process that, that all coercive abuse uses to turn pain and, and harm into love uh, and, and like kind of flip flip reality in that sense. Uh, so naturally, if someone has suffered a lot or, or is empathetic with the suffering in the world, there's a lot of sense in this observation. That, like Even things that make us happy end, the, the, everything is temporary. So their idea is the only real happiness can be in an eternal form by ending birth and death. Um, the... It, it gets more complicated once you learn that, that the methodology for that is not just the chanting, but it's also having a guru, finding a person to submit yourself oh, yes. to who can guide you through this multiple lifetimes process, ultimately. Um, and once you, you get kind of formalized, ideologically rooted authoritarian structures it's just very ripe and in my opinion inevitable that things will go sour even though you grew up in the Hare Krishnas you weren't particularly devout and at 18 you joined an offshoot of the Krishnas cool. as you said so why did you join this offshoot and what was it like living that life I was fortunate among a lot of Hare Krishnas uh, to not 
be raised super strictly. I never went to the boarding schools, which they used to have a lot more of. There was a lot of child abuse that went on in them. Still, still does, I want to say, uh, especially in India. But I was raised in the suburbs, a more kind of laid back life. My mother was a full believer, but really struggled with her own involvement and the stringent rules and the, the um, really the psychological harm that one endures in decades in that kind of institution, especially as a woman. So um, I wasn't raised super heavily indoctrinated, but it's the backdrop of, of your whole life at the same time. Um, my legal name from birth has been a Hare Krishna name. Uh, we were vegetarian, like we were different than my friends, that was clear. But uh, it wasn't until I was like 17, 18, that I really got serious. A few years prior, my, my brother had gotten really devout, my older brother, and he preached to me in some ways that were very compelling. I couldn't defeat him as a 14, 15-year-old <laughs> arguing philosophy, and so it kind of planted in my head that like this is ultimately what I should do with my life when I'm ready. Uh, but at the same time, from a, from a normal kind of societal perspective, like I was living in a very dysfunctional childhood. I was the kind of person who joins a group in their young adulthood, even if they weren't born into one. I, you know, my, my mother was very sick, uh, both physically with cancer and things like that. And I, I dropped out of school in eighth grade and started working full time and I smoked pot and hung out with older people. And it was a you know, at the time, it was just normal. It was what my life was. But in hindsight, I recognized looking at teenagers that this wasn't <laughs> the standard experience. So all that said, um, you know, my adolescent and adult life started coming at me. And in hindsight, I can see I wasn't prepared for that in different ways. I, I like dating and romance were really intimidating to me. And I had a close friend commit suicide and that really shifted things at a certain point for me. Like I should get serious about all this spiritual stuff. Like I'm, I'm beating around the bush, wasting my time entertaining other ideas. And so I took a more serious dive and in my milu was uh, the recorded lectures of the, the guy who I would eventually join his office. He had been in the main Hare Krishna organization until the 80s and then started his own thing, lots of politics, etc. Would you, would you call him a guru? Oh, yeah. He, he, yeah, he was my guru eventually. Like, I formally became his disciple and oh. was his assistant. And, and we'll get to all that in more detail, I'm sure. Uh, but his lectures were around like my, my, my mother and some of her friends had started listening to him. He had some novel in that same perspectives. He was more liberal. He preached in kind of newer intellectual ways and, and, and it was attractive to people who uh, had struggled to fit into this really conservative religious environment for decades. So here was someone explaining things in a little more contemporary and generous way. So his CDs were kind of floating around. This was on the East Coast where I lived. And so I was listening to him while participating with the other organization and slowly, for whatever various reasons, his kind of preaching was the most attractive to me. I was active on a forum of his disciples and uh, eventually he invited, basically I found a controversy about him on the internet and it really distressed me, him and another and another guru basically who don't like each other and and when I brought that up he kind of made his move and invited me to come live there and stay stay at his monastery as we called it in in the woods of northern California off um, off grid using solar power and milking cows and and so on so I weighed that for about a month and, and I eventually did. I, I moved there at 18, not sure that I was going to be his disciple or if I was going to stay there for good. I had some skepticism, but uh, yeah, I did become his disciple. <laughs> so somewhere along the line, you began to have doubts. So can you talk about that? Was it 
one particular thing or a series of things that made your faith in the leader crumble? I, I became, once I moved in at 18, I was heavily involved for uh, almost seven years, like heavily involved, part of the leadership eventually, the leader's assistant, privy to all the finances, and, you know, emails and everything. So, I, I mean, it's hard to convey the extent of an entire life 24 seven, basically invested in a community, you do everything. Um, so when you're saying what causes one to leave, it's, it, it's kind of like slowly all these threads come together. I mean, I saw so much manipulation and suffering. I was manipulated out of six figures of, of income that was, uh, for my college, for my grandfather, um, on and on. But it wasn't for for some years that that be started becoming apparent to me and, and occasionally i was really just unhappy you know I, I like couldn't identify the source of why my life was so um like distressing and hopeless kind of but but it was certainly like that and and my role in the group felt like a job even though i was paying into it not getting paid in any way shape or form it's lack of psychological health that manifests in so many ways is partly why I left. But one was loneliness. You know, I, I was a monk. I was planning to be celibate for life at the time when I joined at 18. And uh, that was a foolish decision. <laughs> and over time, I, I was lonely, not just in like a, a sexual sense, which is how these groups want to depict, especially celibate groups. Anyone who deviates is like, it's just carnal instincts uh but there was actually like you're living with people and you don't know each other you're you're there there's no emotional intimacy there's no genuine vulnerability it's scripted vulnerabilities about how you're bad in xyz way or you used to be bad in xyz way and the guru saved you and and, and things like that and so that was never I think you're gonna cut it for me, um, and and so eventually I was out on the road making money for the group, being labor trafficked as as I've come to understand in the last year through my studies and and, and learning what actually constitutes human trafficking and labor exploitation and so on, like literally by the book, uh, being labor trafficked. Um, so would this be selling books, or that's the kind of thing uh, I see in my town, is they're basically trying to sell books? Uh, no, this was, in our specific instance at this point in time, in, at, towards the end of my involvement, uh, we were working at, in America, we have state fairs, county fairs, these like events for a week to a month, depending on where they're held, uh, with events and rides and so on, but also a large part of it is commercial products. And so we were just salespeople at one of these booths for a company. Uh, but the reason is, I mean, this is the kind of industry transient people work in. You, you bust your butt every day for like six months of the year, make cash, uh, live in shitty hotels kind of traveling around around the country and then you don't work the other six months and there's no there's no like education required so it's the kind of industry that people in a cultic setting will naturally find themselves in when there's a need for money as as are illegal industries and um you know there's a, f a fair bit of marijuana industry involvement among some Hare Krishnas because especially second generation they're raised to not exist in society to not have skills to not even aspire to an education or, or so on yeah so towards the end I was being I was I was basically uh, experiencing labor exploitation and at the same time that did give me a bit of freedom uh, of interacting with people outside of the group more frequently and so on and and like secretly started dating, like living this double life, which was really difficult for me. And I had a lot of shame about it because I'm a prominent monk in this, in this organization at the time. Um, so eventually that's what caused me to leave monasticism 
and, and that degree of involvement in the group. But to justify that departure, I started a business expressly for the purpose of making money for the group and hoping to grow to where I could employ other group members. I basically was like, I'm not going to be a monk anymore, but my whole life is still primarily dedicated to the cause. And I moved out of the monastery and whatnot. It wasn't until a year later that I lost faith in the, in the whole thing. And it was largely the realization that the problems in the group, which were discussed and which I was passionate about making us healthier, uh, like a, a healthier functioning institution, the problems were by design. They weren't actually like an accident. They, they were the direct result of the leader's actual motives uh, and character. And that realization was basically the shift from, okay, some things are unhealthy here, but we all want to reform it. We all have the same goal to the realization that, oh no, the, the entire theory that this person was going to guide me to my ultimate good in a selfless way if I sacrifice everything was was wrong that that contract was a farce and broken long ago um and that it was the beginning of an extremely tumultuous nine months year several years still in it i don't know it's <laughs> You decided to write a blog about your disillusionment in the group, the hypocrisy, misuse of funds, etc. And when you published this, it helped quite a lot of people. But you had some apprehensions about publishing it, didn't you? I did. I, I knew from the day that I had what I call the conceptual break from the group, but the, the whole religion, the whole foundation, my whole framework for reality, really, from that day, I knew that I wanted to speak out because I had been prominent in this group. We were a small group, but that that didn't matter to me. I've been a, a kind of an essential cog and, and paid a lot of money into it and so on. And I knew everything and I knew everyone because I would travel with the leader. So it was important to me to just, you know, set the record straight on my own involvement. And so... It was three months until I published it, and I had panic attacks in anticipation of, of it. I wasn't sure how I was going to do it, because I was living through this period of, like, torment, like a level of distress I didn't know existed prior to this, and the notion that I was potentially going to unleash that on people I cared about is not something you take lightly. You know, I... I, I cared and still do care about so many of them and it's not that i want them to to feel pain but unfortunately in situations like this the truth is devastating and uh so so i, I wrote my piece uh, I, I had gotten a letter from from the guru <clears throat> i always hesitate to say his name but it's swami Tripurari. people should know <laughs> not a good guy. Uh, I got an email from him at a certain point after I had kind of taken distance from the group and not been participating. And it was this very manipulative email. Um, and I decided this was the context to finally speak out. And so I responded as an open letter to him and the community at large and just laid everything out there. All the financial details, uh, shady things that were being done with money, ways that the nonprofit status was being abused unethically, ways that members were being abused, ways that I had been abused, um, so on. And I, and I put it up on a blog and shared it on Facebook where I had probably over 600 Hare Krishna friends at the time and just let the, the shit hit the fan, so to speak. And um, it did help some number of people and some people attacked me, but I've gotten messages from all over the world and continue to in, in a small degree um, that in some way or another are expressing that, that what I've said helped them. Whether, like people who had been involved and uninvolved for a decade, but still carry the kind of guilt that comes with being convinced this one lifestyle is the ideal 
And so some people can't shake that, but can also live that lifestyle. And so like, if I'm able to pull back the curtain and be like, actually this ideal claim, like this is what was actually going on here. Uh, and someone specifically wrote me about my, my little offshoot group and said like it helped them kind of let go of the sense of failure that they had had by not being able to live in the monastery. And that kind of thing makes it all really worth it. And I've continued to speak about these issues in different contexts and I continue to get a small trickle of people reaching out to me and I don't have a strong agenda except like, yeah, if someone is trying to sort out the way their mind's been twisted and contorted for years or decades, I'm happy to be a sounding board and, you know. Natalia, I'm sure that you still keep a close eye on the Harry Krishnas and how they operate. Is there anything new that they do these days, for instance, uh, as a way of recruiting? You know, my interests are far broader than this, and I'm studying uh, psychology of coercive control, and, and this realm is very dear to me, but, like, the Hare Krishnas are not going to define my life, uh, <laughs> despite their best efforts. So I do keep some eye, and I feel like, as one of the few people who publicly speaks about them, there's a slight kind of watchdog function that, that naturally comes there. But uh, all that's to say, there's so much more going on that I'm completely unaware of, absolutely. But yeah, there are definitely trends. Um, as with any group, ultimately, they need resources, they need people, and they need money. So a lot of groups despite wanting to depict themselves as kind of absolute and unaffected by circumstances, they just, they just have the truth, take it or leave it, they end up tailoring how they think and how they present themselves to the trends of the times. So for quite a while, Hare Krishnas have made endeavors in different ways to kind of uh, intertwine their, their goals with yoga community settings and uh, sometimes new age settings, but especially like yoga communities and alternative health, Ayurveda, like these things have a lot of cultural currency. And so they become an environment where a, a portion of people will potentially be receptive to this message. So if you have Hare Krishna figures, say regularly speaking in a circuit of yoga studios, it's not necessarily that the yoga studio is a Hare Krishna front or anything, but a portion of those people are extra receptive beyond the general population to this kind of message, and you'll get and you'll get some from those communities. And so it's kind of, I mean, I consider it opportunism. It's like wherever there's potential, go go for it. Um, so I would say that's one of the biggest ways. I mean, other ways. <clears throat> The Hare Krishnas are kind of like, if anyone can have success preaching, they're like, go for it. They love if someone gets famous. So there's there's like a, a social media figure who is not overtly a Hare Krishna, but he is uh, an initiated member. And if you know Hare Krishna ideology, you see how it is completely like the, 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 the ground in which his self-help stuff is rooted um and he's making it big like kind of mainstream and so uh yeah I, I guess i would say in summary the the attempt is whoever will give us the best hearing let's let's find them and so these days that tends to be uh yoga alternative health eastern people who are into eastern spirituality things like that uh, I'll leave links to your blog and social media in the description below. But before we go, if anyone who's watching this is perhaps considering joining the Hare Krishnas or any similar group, what advice would you give to them right now? I mean, I think with the internet, it's easier than ever just to, to really be informed. I mean, the, the fundamental violation, in a sense, is basically one gets involved in a group like this and 
and pledges a psychological allegiance without informed consent. And uh, unfortunately, for, for various reasons, the way it seems to work is once we're invested to a certain degree, disconfirming or challenging evidence or uh, behaviors don't hold the weight that they, that they ought to or that they would have early on. So I think it's important in general with what people get involved with now because there's abusive businesses, there's all sorts of things early on to do the research because that is when we have the clearest mind about it, frankly. Uh, just like if we learn early on in a, in a courtship or a dating scenario that, that, that someone has a murder record, you know, that, that'll inform us, but it might be kind of harder to react appropriately if, if right. it's five years later and we're in love or if it's five weeks later and we're infatuated. Uh, so and a, a group which uh, says it's going to change your life, it's much more better to uh, research something like that, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, 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 ex exactly. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I think that's the fundamental. And just really stay in touch with, like, what are your values, the, the values that you joined for, that you felt were embodied by this organization a year later, two years later, is that really what your life is consisting of? Helping people or growing internally or, or whatever, like really kind of taking stock of the, the promises and, and, the, and what's delivered. Okay, right, I think that's really powerful, really excellent, thank you so much for uh, for speaking out, but uh, before we sign off, uh, where would you say, Nitai, that you are in your life right now, and what are you working towards? I'm, I'm pretty excited these days. I, I, as I mentioned, I'm completing a very unique degree uh, that was developed recently in the UK, a master's in the psychology of coercive control, so we basically look at these subjects across contexts, be that gangs, terrorist groups, religious cults, uh, intimate partner violence, human trafficking, as I mentioned. And uh, I'm really excited about that kind of interdisciplinary approach to um, manipulation and, and harm and trying to prevent and help it. And uh, recently, I'm starting to do a little bit of, of work assisting the Open Minds Foundation and a new project of theirs called Educare, which uh, is like a free educational system for people who have left groups uh so on the whole I, you know I'm, I'm feeling upbeat about kind of the next phase of my life the next identity from from just being defined by the group involvement to kind of shifting towards the work that i care about excellent natai yeah. joseph thank you very much indeed thank you